NetWorksRadio.com presents David Waldman, Kegro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, October 13th, 2020. It is time for yet another show. And uh, all right, uh, I'm just going to nap through this one, I think. Uh, I'll just let all the other folks come on and take care of business today. we got a lot lined up for today and a lot to catch up with for today. But uh, for now, Bill Bill's awake. At least we have that going for us. One of the two of us is awake with his morning tweet about this morning's KITM program, the k in the Morning Radio Show Live Now. That's what this whole announcement thing is about here. k X, that's me. That's how you can reach me on Twitter, by the way. If, for by some chance, you're a brand new listener... And you want, or an old listener, and you forgot about this, I suppose you could do this. Redirect the show. Tweet us at, uh, send it directly to, you can find me on Twitter at KGROX, K A G R O X. On uh, Twitter, you can find me by email that way too at gmail.com. You know, the famous Gmail thing. And of course, if you do use Twitter, try and use our KGRO in the morning K I T M hashtag just so that your comment hangs around a little longer. <clears throat> So we have a better chance of catching it before it slips away with all the rest of the Twitter chatter. But here's what we've got on tap for today. Uh, me, David Waldman, K X, wonders if maybe today, maybe today is the day Trump unveils the big October surprise. It is October and I love surprises. It's his free and instant miracle cure for COVID dropped from helicopters from coast to coast. Take that, Biden. I bet you can't push something out of the door of a helicopter flying over the coasts. Uh... We're still waiting on that. We're approaching the completion of the fifth day since Trump videotaped himself on what I believe is the South Lawn of the White House, promising that every vulnerable senior, every senior, because they're all so vulnerable, but yet not vulnerable, but also the most vulnerable, but in some ways not vulnerable at all, like me, a Superman. I'm a senior as well. Everybody was going to get the cure. The instant miracle cure that had taken a hospitalized Donald Trump and turned him around within minutes. You remember the video. He was ready to leave the hospital right away, but they made him wait until the next day just to be safe. But he felt 100% better, 20 years younger. It's going to be made available free for all of you who are vulnerable to the coronavirus. That was five days ago. 3,200 and something people have died waiting for the delivery of the miracle instant cure, but whatever, and I'm going to do some rallies, and I'm going to watch some more TV, and pretty soon I imagine he'll be out playing golf again <clears throat> as well. I don't know, although he may, he may know that he's in electoral trouble, and I'm, we, it's possible that we might not see him on the golf course until... After the election, I guess, at which point he just never does anything else again. If he loses, I imagine he just plays golf the rest of his life, if he even acknowledges it. If he wins, I imagine he gloats and then plays golf and nothing else for the rest of his life. And uh, unless he still has in his head the possibility of running for a third term to make up for the first one, which was ruined by people saying mean things about him because of, you know, his being a real grown up and everything. I don't know. I still think that's like one of the most egregious uh, sets of lies I've ever seen him or anybody else tell to stand there in the middle of a pandemic bordering on panic and tell everybody, uh, I've got a miracle cure that will save you from the brink of death and return you to health, not only uh, where you were before, but feeling 20 years younger and it's going to be free, and we've got it now, and I'm going to go inside, and I'm going to sign an order that it be distributed immediately and have no intention of doing any of those things and there not being any such drug. And apparently the drug dosage costs something in the neighborhood of $100,000, but everybody's going to get it for free, and also it's going to be great for the economy, and uh, I hate that. You know the whole, you know, what can I tell you? The whole thing is crazy. He's insane, <clears throat> and we all have to, I guess, live with it until he decides he's going to uh, give up and go home, having been handed his hat in the election. <sighs> but other than that, everything's going really well. There's some breaking-ish 
news. I guess yesterday uh, we uh, I, we must have gotten this news yesterday. I didn't uh, realize it until this morning when I was reading a uh, you know, relatively lengthy Twitter thread from a law professor, an election law and voting rights law professor uh, from where? Who am I looking at here? University of Kentucky. It is Josh Douglas having something of a, uh, I think, appropriate Twitter freak out over the Fifth Circuit Court ruling in Texas's case uh, <clears throat> in which uh, the governor of Texas uh, ordered that each Texas county would be limited to one and only one ballot drop box, which of course makes a whole lot of sense because some of the counties in Texas have about 3,000 people in them and some of the counties in Texas have Houston in them and that's much bigger <clears throat> than, uh, <clears throat> than some of these smaller counties. <clears throat> and uh, pardon me, a little uh, frog attack in the, in the morning here. But uh, yeah, uh, they apparently did some real gymnastics to get around to well, this is indicative of a lot of the problems that we might see with Republican and particularly Trump court packing in all this time. They managed, I think, to come up with a three-judge panel, all of whom had been appointed by Trump, which is ordinarily would be a fairly unusual occurrence in uh, before a president had completed the fourth year of his term. Uh, and in his first term at that, of course, um, ordinarily not a, not a thing that happens a whole lot, though it has happened, and I'm sure it happens from time to time. But think about the odds of drawing three judges appointed by the president, the current president, seeking re-election on the basis of, in particular, on the basis of this sort of uh, voting rights manipulation to get this sort of decision. So Josh summarizes it this way, breaking the Fifth Circuit upholds Texas having only one ballot drop per county. Implausibly, the court finds that the Texas governor's decision expands the right to vote instead of restricts it. Up is down, as Professor Douglas puts it here. And that's what you'd have to do, I guess, to arrive at this decision, uh, given the, ex you know, the, the existence, anyway, of the continued existence of the Voting Rights Act, uh, though it's been gutted, Certainly, you still kind of have to approach questions uh, w w with the basic inquiry in mind of, well, is this restricting the right to vote? And of course, you're in court because someone believes that it is, and that would be most normal people. Uh, yeah, so a little crazy here. He, is, uh, he got a link to the opinion here, <clears throat> but also links to one of his own tweets about it, uh, which says uh, three Trump appointees uphold Republican governor's decision to allow only one drop box per county in Texas. Welcome to voting rights law in 2020. Uh, I guess he's got a, uh, a link here to where he heard the news. A reporter for the Austin American statesman Chuck Lindell, who... I guess, broke the news as soon as it happened. Josh continues from there. Pay attention to this footnote. Now, it's a very long block of text that he has taken a picture of here, and I don't know how much sense the footnote makes to you. I'll give you his interpretation of the footnote. It's a continued attack on the ability of the U.S. Constitution to vigorously protect the right to vote, suggesting that laws that direct the voting process, get it, Laws that direct the voting process aren't actually about the, quote, right to vote. Now, realize, of course, in entering all this, there is at present, believe it or not, no constitutional right to vote. Uh, it's, a, it's a right that a lot of people believe, believe exists, and they derive it from all sorts of other constitutional provisions, but there is nowhere guaranteed in the Bill of Rights the right to actually cast a a ballot. It was a considered a you know a, a fairly limited franchise by the founders. You know, unfortunate mistake of their time, I think. But uh, certainly something that could have been remedied in the last two hundred and whatever years. 
But, you know, circumstances get in the way, and uh, we haven't gotten around to it. Uh, are you interested in the actual text of the footnote? I guess we can we can take out all of the parenthetical notes that don't help us understand this thing to try and cut down on the density of it a little bit here. The secretary persuasively argues that under McDonald v. Board of Election Commissioners of Chicago, a 1969 case, the October 1st proclamation, that is the Texas governor's proclamation, does not implicate the right to vote at all. Uh, hmm. And uh, pointing to, I guess, the McDonald case, distinguishing the right to vote from a claimed right to receive absentee ballots. We're really splitting hairs here at this point. Uh, let's see. In McDonald, it is observed, the Supreme Court told us that the fundamental right to vote does not extend to a claimed right to cast an absentee ballot by mail. In other words, I mean, it, for, for this situation, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the fact that you have to risk your life standing outside among potentially infected people with little to no distance between you and very little protection, if any, uh, from their spreading the virus to you. It might kill you, whatever. The point is, you could do that. So has your quote-unquote right to vote really been curtailed by telling people that they have to risk their lives for it? Do you really have to have a right to do it at home, by mail, in safety? Eh, maybe, maybe not. That's kind of the, the position from which they're approaching this thing. Because the secretary is likely to prevail under the relatively more stringent anderson Burdick framework, no explanation in this footnote of what that is. Election law uh, folks, I guess, will know, but I think for our purposes it's okay not to. But because the secretary is likely to prevail under the more stringent framework, we need not assess McDonald's impact. Uh, not like supersizing things, but the, the McDonald case as they mentioned at the opening here. That said, we recognize there is force to the argument that McDonald applies with equal rigor to early voting as it does to absentee voting. Different thing, of course. After all, both forms of voting are affirmative accommodations offered by the state and designed to make voting more available. You see, and, and so that's the basic problem and premise from which the court is approaching this thing, you and I in common sense world say uh, it's restrictive of the right to vote, whether whether we view it as a right or not, to say all the people in Houston have to use one ballot box and that's it. That's it. And the court is saying, hey, the fact that there's a ballot box at all is an expansion of access to the vote. So uh, the, we don't have to reach the question of is it enough of an expansion to be a reasonable accommodation. The fact is it's an expansion period. We could just make you stand in line on election day and nothing else and still have afforded you the quote unquote right to vote, even if there was only one voting machine for the entire district. Uh, but, uh, and so therefore, you know, we don't have to look at the rest. We're just not interested in how much convenience it adds for one county versus another, uh, cause there was an equal protection argument made here too. And they said, look, it is equal. Everybody got one. That's as equal as it could possibly get. I mean, they really were willing to put those kind of blinders on to make this decision. And it should surprise no one, of course, that, if you can get three Trump appointed judges together, they'll come up with something stupid like this. And they did. And the only thing standing between, uh, well, the only thing standing between this scheme working for the rest of the election and rescuing stranded voters in Texas is for the Supreme court, which is at the moment down one, uh, to step in and say, yes, we will hear and decide and enforce the ruling in this case between now and the election in like three weeks. And that's not happening. So this means essentially, I would think that the Fifth Circuit, though the Fifth Circuit could sit on bunk and 
on an emergency basis and change things, the likelihood of their making an accommodation for this is probably pretty low. So we're still stuck in this footnote here, by the way. Um, uh, we said here, like, uh, okay, uh, that said, we recognize there's force to the McDonald argument that uh, uh, the McDonald argument being, all right, the McDonald case was about absentee voting and they were trying to analogize absentee voting to early voting because they're not exactly the same thing. And they said, okay, well, we recognize that that probably works. Um, but anyway, uh, and it works because both laws are designed to make mo voting more available and are not laws that themselves deny voters the exercise of the franchise. So the very fact that, that you've succeeded in, in making the analogy here, but the success sinks you nonetheless because we don't view either of these laws as shrinking the ability, you know, uh, curtailing the ability to exercise the franchise. For courts to intervene, a voter must show that the state has in fact precluded voters from voting and that the voter has been prohibited from voting by the state. And of course, their view here is uh, if you don't want to wait in line for 11 hours, as we saw people waiting in line in some of the videos circulating on Twitter yesterday, that's on you. It's not the state making you uh, or prohibiting you from voting. They're just saying, hey, it takes a long time. That's just kind of the way it is. And that's that's actually the decision that they ended up making. So you can see why Josh Douglas would spend some time on this. Uh, let's continue with his thoughts on it. He says, it's just so disingenuous for the court to argue that the Texas governor's October 1st order, which explicitly forbid counties, mind you, this is the language that he was using, forbid counties to use more than one drop box after several counties announced that they would do so. They're saying, well, nonetheless, this actually expands the right to vote. Now, you were going to have the right to vote at several drop boxes, but now you're only going to have the right to vote at one. But that's still an expansion in their mind of access to uh, the ability to exercise the franchise because there didn't have to be even one box. But now there is one. So there you go. Uh, let's see another block of text that he's taken a picture of here. The governor's July 27th proclamation effectively extended that hand delivery option of uh of early voting ballots and absentee in person, whatever absentee ballots uh, and the ballots delivered by mail extended the hand delivery option by 40 days. And the impact of the October 1st proclamation can be measured only against that baseline to be sure the proclamation requires a single designated drop off location per County during the expanded 40 day period. But that represents merely a partial refinement of the bounds of a still existing expansion of absentee voting opportunities. <laughs> so you get the idea. Uh, the fact that there's absentee voting opportunities at all is an expansion of access to the franchise that you later decided to curtail the extent of the additional access doesn't change the fact that the access is additional even if it's smaller than it used to be and or or smaller than what was once promised by other counties anyway it's it's real i mean it only works in logic class and even then it probably suggests it's one of those things that the, you know what it's the same logic that they used to use among republicans for the opposite argument the sort of thing that newt gingrich used to say only in washington is a slowdown in the rate of increase of, I think he was talking about, in this case, welfare benefits, considered a cut, right? So it's the same logic working here. Only in the Fifth Circuit of Texas, uh, the Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, uh, here sitting in Texas and ruling for Texas, uh, you know, would a, a, a slowdown in the rate of opening of drop boxes be considered a cut 
in access to the franchise. I guess, I guess, I don't know. Does that work as a consistency point for them? I'm not sure. All right. It's always the voters' fault, Josh Douglas continues, for not jumping through numerous hoops to cast a ballot. It's never incumbent upon the state to make voting easier. That's the current state of voting rights law in the federal courts. Another smallish chunk of text grabbed here. Neither plaintiffs nor the district court have cited any authority suggesting that a state must afford every voter multiple infallible ways to vote. As we explained in TDP1, and I'm not certain what they're referring to here, but I guess another case since it's italicized, mail-in ballot rules that merely make casting a ballot more inconvenient for some voters are not constitutionally suspect. Sounds fun. Happen to have missed that case up to this point. Uh, Josh continues here. Once again, the state receives a pass on demonstrating a precise interest for a law that burdens voters. You know, you, uh, you, you see what he's talking about here. If you've passed, a, ordinarily, I guess courts would say, so you're uh, passing a new law that could potentially uh, burden voters and make it harder for them to vote. You're going to have to demonstrate a precise interest that's uh, an allowable interest, a constitutional uh, interest in upholding this law if you want us not to strike it down. If it's going to make voting more difficult, you're going to have to show us exactly why you wanted to do it, and it's going to have to be a valid reason. Except now... Uh, the state gets a pass on that. No, you don't have to show us the precise interest because apparently some reasons. Maybe they'll be explained here, maybe not. As Josh is saying, once again, the state receives a pass on this necessity of demonstrating its precise interest uh, for a law that burdens voters, which uh, the SCOTUS case, Anderson, had required. The state can simply assert a generalized interest in election administration and preventing voter fraud in order to win its case. States, this little screen grab says, states have critically important interests in the orderly administration of elections and in vigilantly reducing opportunities for voter fraud. And apparently for the Fifth Circuit, that's enough. That's as particular as it has to get. The precise interest is having elections and administering them. That is a huge cop-out. The court here cites the SCOTUS case Crawford, on voter ID laws, but even its site of Crawford is wrong. The court did not uphold Indiana's photo ID law. It instead refused to invalidate it because the plaintiffs didn't have enough evidence of the burdens that it imposed. That's a crucial distinction. However, uh, grabbed here for uh, is, well, you don't need to, we don't need to, to read this particular block. It explains the same thing. Now, I guess reading further into the case, he now uh, gasps and says, oh, my goodness, the court says there is no equal protection problem because the rule, uh, the one ballot box per county is uniform across the state. One drop box per county. What about the fact that counties are different sizes? Mm, not addressed. It's as equal as it can be. One per county. Uh, the screen grab here says the proclamation establishes a uniform rule for the entire state. Each county may designate only one and only one, I guess, really, may designate one early voting clerk's office at which voters may drop off mail ballots during the 40 days leading up to the election. That voters who live further away from a drop, lo drop off location may find it inconvenient to take advantage of this particular additional method to cast their ballots does not limit electoral opportunity as the district court thought as we've explained blah 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 uh they go on from there but i guess that's the end of the little screen grab but that that's basically what they're saying one per county is as equal as it could possibly be and the fact that you might live far far away from that one box well so what then vote on election day that's the way they view it Note, the court does not rest this decision on the Purcell principle, uh, which it says parenthetically, uh, courts shouldn't change election rules as the election nears. Instead, this is all about deference to the state. 
Professor Douglas says, I'm bummed that I have a new leading case for my essay on this very point, in which he's referencing an earlier tweet about this essay, in which he said, today I managed to draft a 4,000-word essay on the federal court's undue deference to state legislatures in 2020 election litigation so far. I can't believe I wrote so much on a Saturday. And uh, he shows you the beginning of this essay, but I think you get the point of it. But uh, keep this one in mind, and maybe we'll have to take a look at that essay at some point. Uh, an important principle he's calling out here, a uh, huge amount of deference to state legislatures from the courts hints at the possibility of uh, how some of these courts, particularly Trump appointees, might rule in cases brought in the counting stage after Election Day. Uh, for instance, if a Republican state legislature was to try to appoint its own Trump slate of electors, despite the outcome of the vote going the other way, or the count not being finished, for that matter, uh, how will courts view this? And it suggests here that if courts are instructed or, or influenced by Trump appointees, to give a greater amount of deference than usual to state legislatures, they might uphold that sort of move, as ridiculous as it seems. All right, we'll throw in one more comment from his thread. In fact, this last one from the thread. Wow, in his concurrence, Judge Ho, yes, Judge Ho, H-O, would go further and restore Texas's even more restrictive voting laws, disregarding the governor's order that moved up early voting. What's the point of courts if they'll just rubber stamp violations of the constitutional right to vote? Well, it uh, depends on who you're asking. If you're asking Republicans and Trump, uh, they've got plenty of use. Thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything. But if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. And uh, I've got, well, you know, news that I was kind of sort of in the back of my head expecting could be the case. Of course, the uh, speaking of all of this court action, the Supreme Court nomination hearing for Amy Coney Barrett taking place uh, at the same time as the show, naturally. And I had some suspicion that Joan might uh, be assigned the task of watching those hearings and reporting on them for the folks reading about it at Daily Coast. And that uh, apparently is the case. If there's a break at any point in the hearing, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Lindsey Graham can't take it anymore and runs out of the room screaming or everybody has to go to the bathroom for an hour, these things do happen, then we'll be able to have her join us at some point during our upcoming second hour discussion. I haven't even mentioned to you what I have on tap for the, the second hour. Do you, do you know about the second hour and what we've got waiting for you? We're going to uh, move from the, uh, the, the, the morning headlines discussion, although that ends up being about the courts and procedure uh, anyway, to a more focused procedural discussion as uh, Eli Zupnik of the newly launched Fix Our Senate campaign joins uh, joins in. I was going to say joins us. The plan originally, of course, was to have Joan come in for her regular Tuesday visit, but maybe come by even a little earlier and have an extended discussion about filibuster reform, or in this case, I guess, filibuster elimination that's, uh, I think, the stated goal of this round of reform, and counts as a reform. It's just a very big one. And uh, it would make for a great, I thought, a great conversation because uh, you have somebody now who's uh, uh, setting aside all of their time professionally to work on campaigning 
for the Senate if it comes under Democratic control. Well, I guess they'll probably campaign for it, whether it comes under Republican or Democratic control. It'd just be a lot more successful, I think, if it was under Democratic control. But campaigning for the uh, re continued filibuster reform, and in this case, the elimination of the legislative filibuster. But uh, I think, of course, everybody envisions this happening more readily and uh, more enthusiastically anyway, under a Democratic Senate with a Democratic president who can sign some of the uh, uh, long-awaited legislation and, uh, and progressive reforms that uh, the country's been waiting for but have been blocked since forever by uh, the, uh, the conservative-leaning anti-majoritarian tool of, of the filibuster. But Eli was going to come on and join us, and still will, at about 10.15 uh, or so, and we'll have an extended discussion about the nature of their campaign and, of course, the underlying issue of the filibuster, uh, what they have in mind, how they intend to approach the campaign, what relation it might bear to previous such campaigns that we've been involved in. Uh, and then Joan would join in as well. And of course, Joan, uh, among the most knowledgeable of those writing about the subject and following it for all these years at Daily Coast, uh, me too. And I thought it would make for an interesting discussion and it still will. And now we can just cross our fingers and hope that there's a break in the action and that Joan can join in because, uh, you know, the discussion would be that much better if we have Joan's voice in it as well. But I, uh, you know, uh, I anticipated this could be a problem. Luckily, I do know a little something about the filibuster and filibuster reform campaign. So I think I can carry the ball for a while with Eli, don't you think? And uh, hey, maybe you've got some comments that you want to add in to the discussion, questions you might want him to answer for you. Gear up, get ready for those, and hashtag them, K-I-T-M. Send them in Twitter. Um, and I suppose if you think you can get me to uh, take a quick look around and email, you might be able to sneak a comment by that way. All right, let's see. Other, uh, I think we've summed it up basically with Josh Douglas and his view of uh, the Fifth Circuit Court ruling here, but I, I did see somebody commenting on his Twitter thread, and so I'm going to take a look at what they're saying and double check, do I understand their comment correctly. Yeah, I guess I do. It's hard to believe that that's the case, so I felt like I needed to double check the comment here from uh, Kelly, uh, although the Twitter handle is... Yeah, I've never figured out what uh, what's the terminology that we use to distinguish between someone's Twitter address, the, the actual, you know, at address that you would actually need to use to find the person and the descriptive name that you can put in there that sometimes actually helps us figure out who you are and what you're called and sometimes doesn't help us at all. Uh, but identifying yourself as Kelly, tweeting as Andrea Gale underscore K, and maybe that K is for Kelly, could be your last name, I don't know. But anyway, uh, sends along a Nick Anderson political cartoon with some annotations on the side, talking about democracy, Texas style. It's about these drop boxes. And uh, this illustrates the, the equal protection weirdness that the court was interested in overlooking. In Harris County, Texas, which is, I believe, where Houston is, Harris County, Texas, population 4.7 million people, ballot box drop-off locations, well, you know the answer to that, one. 4.7 million people. By the way, 1,777 square miles in Harris County. You know, sizable, right? On the other hand, the other side of the state, out in the, uh, in the, in the far west of the state, is Loving County, Texas. And uh, they need to do more Loving in Loving County. The population of Loving County is 169. Nice, right? Uh, but uh, I'm not leaving off the thousand or anything. I mean it. That's it. 100 plus another 69 people. 
is the whole population of the county. Like I'd be saying, that's not a county. That's not even, you know, a small uh, development. What are you doing making this a separate county? But it is 677 square miles. So, you know, people are spread out there. It's a chunk of land that's visible on a map anyway. Um, but 677 square miles versus the uh, 1,777 there's uh, 1,100 more square miles in Harris County, and of course, 4.6999 million more people in Harris County. How many Dropbox locations? One. That's right. So less territory to have to cover, and of course, if everybody in the whole county showed up at the exact same time at the drop-off location, it would take about... I don't know what, 10, 15 minutes at most if people, you know, do that thing where they open the box and look in it and then put the the envelope in there and then close the box and then open the box to make sure that the letter went down like she does in, what is it, when Harry met Sally? I guess it could take 20 minutes for the whole population of Loving County to vote. That's That's equal protection for everybody under the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals understanding, quote unquote understanding of election law. Uh, at least that's the way three Trump appointed judges who are probably each about 15 years old understand it. And uh, <clears throat> I guess we're stuck with that for the time being. Uh, like I said, there could be an appeal on Bank to the full panel of the Fifth Circuit, but the Fifth Circuit is still the Fifth Circuit. So it's not all that likely that it's one of the most conservative circuits, as you might imagine, uh, that's out there. So there you have it. That's what's going on, and that's the way they intend to interpret the election law this time <clears throat> and going forward. So, <clears throat> uh, let's see, another of the big stories uh, circulating on Twitter in the last day or so. I'll just make mention of it because I didn't get to see it myself, but there was a debate in the Kentucky Senate contest. That would mean an, a, a debate between Mitch McConnell and Amy McGrath, <clears throat> and the big takeaway on Twitter about this was a, uh, a a segment during which McGrath is laying into McConnell for uh, his, well, failure, but his intentional failure, his, uh, his policy of not bringing up a second coronavirus relief package on the Senate floor and leaving it for perhaps after the election or maybe never, and just not taking coronavirus relief seriously in general. And I don't know whether it was a coached response, calculated or not, but apparently McConnell spends the whole, the duration of the accusation smiling and laughing, which, you know, if it's me, I, you know, and it happened to me, I'd be explaining it by saying, eh, sometimes when I get uncomfortable with that, you know, what's being said about me, I, I do have a sort of, I have a tendency to break into that kind of nervous laughter, but I think he's just laughing in her face at, uh, I think at the whole thing. But yeah, uh, this is a genuinely meaningful attack. And I mean, I don't think he would acknowledge that, but uh, it, it is, and it will mean a lot to the people of Kentucky. And yet, despite it all, I'm going to be reelected over, you know, uh, probably by a decisive margin because Kentucky is crazy Republican over Amy McGrath. And here she is making as much, uh, uh, every bit of sense there is to be made on the subject. And I'm just laughing in your face and returning to the Senate. I, I, I don't know whether that was what he meant to project or what, but a lot of people watching that and getting outraged, uh, rightfully so. I, I don't know whether it's going to result in another windfall of cash for McGrath. A lot of things do. Um, and, uh, and since everybody else, uh, not everybody else, but a lot of other of the big Senate races seem to be covered uh, earlier, uh, in September, I started to pick up the sense that people were saying, you know, uh, let's invest some money in some other races where we have a better chance of, of winning. I don't know that McGrath has closed the gap any since then, but, uh, she's getting a lot of outrage money, which, you know, quite honestly, uh, although there might be other places to invest strategically, I don't know. There's there's certain value to keeping people engaged. They're not breaking the bank and selling their homes and risking it all 
to make an extra donation to Amy McGrath, although they may be doing it across the board and sending lots of money everywhere. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world if people are saying, well, you know, I want to take some shots at McConnell, win or lose. Uh, it's okay by me. I don't hold it against anybody contributing there. And, and maybe it was the right thing to do. And maybe we all ought to be doing it. Uh, or maybe this will change things in some late breaking decision making by, uh, if not real undecided voters, then people who uh, were being laggards about casting their vote early and might change their mind. All right, let's see. Other big stories of the day before we switch to the big uh, filibuster topic. A couple of interesting stories I thought I could squeeze in here. Uh, one, of course, Trump rallying again. He was in Florida last night, well before... Uh, the expiration of what is the real required and uh, proper quarantining and isolation routine post-COVID diagnosis. Trump, of course, packed himself onto Air Force One and flew himself down to Florida, and he might have gone more or less by himself. We saw some video of him getting on the plane. By the way, I will note, Interesting that he is using the lower deck stairs these days to get on and off of Air Force One, no longer climbing the big stairs to the second deck, which is the normal uh, boarding procedure. Uh, stairs are difficult for him. And it was raining and everything. I was really rooting. It was a good chance that the stairs were finally going to take him out, but it didn't work. And they're shortening the trip now because, ooh, they want to keep him safe and alive. Wow. So, all right, I'll allow for it. Uh, I do note for the record, though, uh, another new development. Trump has learned to close his umbrella. That's a new thing for him. Usually he reaches the top of the stairs, and I guess may maybe he was winded from the climb all those other times, even without coronavirus, and he would then toss the umbrella and just, you know, somebody else's problem. I made it into the plane without getting my hair wet. Now somebody else has to deal with this. Even if Melania is there, as he was famously, you know, uh, making his way to the plane under the umbrella by himself and having Melania have to tag along after him, getting wet on the way to the plane. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I also uh, will note for the record that uh, you know, what other people were watching, of course, was Trump boarding the plane without a mask on and noting that for the first time, the Air Force personnel, including the uh, dress uniformed personnel at the bottom of the staircase, saluting him as he goes by, were masked as well. And everyone around him was masked. Trump was unmasked. Of course, his view of it is, I've already got coronavirus. You can't give me more. Uh, that's not really the problem, of course. It's usually about him giving it to others, but he doesn't care about or acknowledge others. So why wear a mask? So there he goes, getting onto the plane without a mask. But I, again, I note the umbrella here. Eh, he's got something to protect his hair from droplets, but the face, uh, everybody else's health? No, that doesn't enter into it. The important object here is my hair, my makeup, my face. I'll cover myself and make sure I don't get any droplets on me that way. The ones that can actually make you sick, those are healthy droplets. Can't have them on my hair. The ones that can make you sick, you all have to eat them and get on the plane with me. Uh, no indication from that short bit of video who was staffing the flight? That's the other thing. Like, uh, I, you know, Kaylee McEnany, she's out of action. Apparently never got the miracle instant cure from Trump and never will. Uh, many people noting this morning, Melania still missing in action. Hasn't even given the miracle cure to his wife or mentioned her, by the way, or given any sort of indication of an update on her health or whatever. But, you know, he's nominally married to this woman. And I guess that's all that he's interested in. Uh, but no, uh, no video of other staffers. Who's going to risk sitting on a plane with him for a couple hours, then going to the rally with him for a couple hours, and then coming home while he's <clears throat> still sick with coronavirus, even though uh, allegedly Sean Connolly puts out another, well, someone puts out in Sean Connolly's name, another unsigned memo saying everything's just fine. He's not contagious anymore. And then, of course, he goes down to the rally and he tells everybody at the rally, I'm immune from coronavirus. 
And then, you know, everyone's circulating video of him saying, I'm going to, I can come down in the audience and kiss every one of you. Uh, which is something he might have contemplated doing in, in earlier days, maybe even now. But he's, of course, uh, I think he's a little too afraid for that. But uh, there he is, unmasked, getting on there. And apparently it wasn't just staff reluctant to go with him. The New York Times is reporting under this headline, as Trump flouts safety protocols, news outlets balk at close coverage. Newspapers and networks are wary of exposing their staff members to the president and his aides, saying they do not have assurance that the basic precautions will be taken to protect reporters' health. There's a long story that goes with it, but I think you get the idea. Uh, But maybe we can figure out which outlets are refusing to go. It does say, as Trump might put it, major Major news organizations have become increasingly wary of sending journalists to travel with Trump to White House events and campaign rallies as the president and his aides continue to shun safety protocols after an outbreak of coronavirus within their ranks. This is the reporting, by the way, of Michael Greenbaum, Greenbaum, G-R-Y-N-B-A-U-M. The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, all among the major outlets that have declined to assign reporters to travel with Trump as he returns to the trail this week, yesterday, in fact, saying they do not have assurance that the basic precautions will be taken to protect reporters' health. And they they don't. Foremost among the flouters is Trump himself, who, despite recently contracting the virus and spending three nights in the hospital, has shown little willingness to change his habits. Obviously, we know why that is. He's an idiot. On Saturday, again, he said the virus would soon disappear, And on the way to a rally in Florida on Monday, he boarded Air Force One where reporters were seated in the cabin without wearing a mask. At least three White House correspondents have tested positive for coronavirus in the past two weeks, including a Times reporter who had traveled on Air Force One, Michael D. Scheer. Safety concerns may also complicate Trump's tentative NBC town hall on Thursday. One of his last remaining chances to make his case for a large national audience NBC execs have asked the White House for proof that their employees will not face undue risks at the event, according to two people familiar with the discussion. Um, That's a wide open uh, uh, request, and uh, I would expect uh, if they knew what they were doing, they would refine the request. They'll ask for proof. They'll be provided another one of Conley's memos. They really need to. I mean, this is a great opportunity to carry the ball forward and say all these unsigned memos and even a signed memo, quite honestly. How do I know he signed it with you? I could believe he would forge it. Uh, How do I know he wrote the thing? How do I know he knows what he's talking about? How do I know he's not just lying? How do I know you're not trying to intentionally infect uh, the evil fake news media? I, I don't know. I don't see how they could take his word for it unless he agreed to some sort of independent medical evaluation, and he would never do that. I don't know. The story goes on. There's comments here from Kaylee McEnany from from quarantine, I guess. Still hasn't been cured with the miracle drugs and is commenting, though, about uh, how safe and awesome they all are. Let's see. There's uh, more... Uh, discussion of what's happening because the major papers are are refusing to go along. The White House press pool is very often manned by one of the reporters from the major outlets, and now they have to kind of look around, cast about elsewhere for somebody to do the press pooler duties here. Um, Let's see. It's uh, typically the story picks up again is also is a coveted assignment. But this week, at least seven major news outlets declined to accept one of the available press seats on Trump's plane, according to people familiar with the internal planning discussions. Publications including BuzzFeed News, the Los Angeles Times, Politico, and Hearst newspapers have also declined pool slots in recent days. So it's a pretty widespread phenomenon, just, you know, kind of worth pointing out. There's a lot more to the story, of course. But uh, I'll hop around. I think we got the important points. Uh, A couple other interesting items to share with you. Um, Let me go to this one because it's from an unusual source. Uh, Not the reference to the source, but the actual source itself. L Magazine, which ordinarily I, you know, don't use as a go-to. Oh, look, there's there's another story that they're illustrating in this 
with a picture from from When Harry Met Sally. So very relevant film today for whatever reason. But uh, I picked this one up because, you know, the the topic is relevant uh, in a number of ways. And it's good reporting. And it's always interesting when you get one uh, from a, a source that you didn't think to look at earlier. I think I picked this up in a tweet, you know, on... Uh, the other day on, on the subject, and I think it must have been probably Elise Hogue who was uh, tweeting about, uh, no surprise, about the, the abortion issue now that Amy Coney Barrett's nomination is under consideration. But uh, what an interesting story and an interesting subject for the story. Uh, let's see. Laura Bassett writes this piece again for Elle magazine. Senator Gary Peters shares his abortion story. Yes, he's got one. And I thought it was important to to share because I did. I skimmed the story to see what it was, and I thought it was an important and, and interesting and, and meaningful one. But also, Gary Peters is uh, locked in a tight contest for re-election in Michigan, and it's a tight race. And I understand that it was uh, he was all over Twitter yesterday, or the the news of the race was all over Twitter yesterday because I think it's like a one point contest, and people pointing out it to be very difficult to accomplish the goal of flipping and holding the Senate for Democrats if we were to lose a seat where there is a Democrat currently. And I guess there's some danger of that happening. Uh, And it was a big fundraising boost for him yesterday to have the story that he was locked in a tight race circulating. Now, this might actually interest you in participating in the fundraising for the race. If, If that wasn't enough for you and you wanted to know a little bit more about Gary Peters, who could blame you? There's not a lot of people that know a great deal about Gary Peters. He's definitely not a Senate showboat. Totally different kind of guy. And this story was just interesting, and I imagine that it could become uh, a featured story in the in the Barrett hearings as well. Uh, so it starts out this way. U.S. Senator Gary Peters, a low-key moderate Democrat from Michigan, is in a very tight re-election race that could decide whether his party wins the Senate. But he's not the kind of guy who typically makes national headlines. He's more known for being a dad who enjoys riding his motorcycle and drinking the local beer. That's a nice profile, if you can get it. Than he is for saying attention-grabbing things. So it may come as a surprise that with this story, he will become the first sitting senator in American history. Is this right? To publicly share a personal experience with abortion. That's, uh, you know, it's believable in that, you know, there aren't a whole lot of women senators historically. So that's one thing. But, you know, uh, what about the husbands of women who had a personal experience with abortion? Well, they don't talk about it to this point. It's a story of how gut wrenching and complicated decisions can be related to reproductive health. A situation I went through with my first wife, he told me in a phone interview Sunday afternoon in the late 1980s. In Detroit, Peters and his then wife, Heidi, were pregnant with their second child, a baby they very much wanted. Heidi was four months along when her water broke, leaving the fetus without amniotic fluid. That's obviously a fairly serious situation. This now, of course, reminds me, this is probably where, now a few minutes ago, was probably where maybe I offered a trigger warning to those who might be upset by the story of a miscarriage here. But uh, I think our audience is probably strong enough to handle this one. Uh, But as you could guess, obviously, without amniotic fluid, uh, not conditions in which the baby could possibly survive. The doctor told the Peters to go home and wait for a miscarriage to happen naturally. But it didn't happen. They went back to the hospital the next day and the doctor detected a faint heartbeat. He recommended an abortion, though, because, of course, the fetus still had no chance of survival, but it wasn't an option due to a hospital policy banning the procedure because blanket ban, because barbaric practice, as Amy Comey Barrett says. So he sent the couple home again. Can you imagine this? Just think about putting yourself in this situation. I sent them home again to await a, a miscarriage. The mental anguish someone goes through is intense, Peters says, trying to have trying to have a miscarriage for a child that was wanted. 
As they waited, Heidi's health deteriorated. When she returned to the hospital on the third day, after another night without a natural miscarriage, the doctor told her the situation was dire. She could lose her uterus in a matter of hours if she wasn't able to have an abortion, and if she became septic from the uterine infection, she could die. You know, the thing they always tell you, uh, the, the exception they say they're willing to allow to save the life of the mother, right? The doctor appealed to the hospital's board for an exception to their anti-abortion policy and was denied. I still vividly remember he left a message on the answering machine. That's what it's reduced to, thanks to this policy. They refused to give me permission, not based on good medical practice, simply based on politics. I recommend you immediately find another physician who can do this procedure quickly, Peters recalls. So if you like your doctor, uh, tough. We don't like the procedure you want. So not only can you not have that, but you've got to find a new doctor because we'll prevent this doctor from doing it at this hospital. The Peters were able to get into another hospital right away. Why? Because they were friends with the hospital's chief administrator. Heidi was rushed into an emergency abortion that saved her uterus and possibly her life. The whole experience was painful and traumatic, Heidi shared in a statement. If it weren't for urgent and critical medical care, I could have lost my life. So no surprise, I'm sure, to our audience that, yes, there are plenty of situations in which an abortion is medically necessary to save the life of the mother, and for various other reasons as well. We all know this. Republicans like to block it out of their mind. Uh, but this is just an interesting story and an interesting thing that he would choose to share. And uh, if you've uh, heard that he was locked in a tight race but said to yourself, I just don't know anything about him, maybe this might motivate you to try and help save his seat with a donation at the last minute. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back now to the KGR Under Morning Show on Networks Radio. Uh, it's not that long of an article. Maybe we'll continue with it just to give some more color surrounding the situation and uh, uh, bring an end, natural end, to the story here. Reflecting on the experience now, Senator Peters says it enacted a and enacted yes enacted an incredible emotional toll. I might have gone with exacted on that, but so why go public with it? Uh, and the answer he gives here, it's important for folks to understand that these things happen to folks every day, he explains. I've always considered myself pro-choice and believe women should be able to make these decisions by themselves or, or at least for themselves. It doesn't say anything. I added an extra word in there and says, uh, make these decisions themselves. But when you live it in real life, you realize the significant impact it can have on a family. Peters decided to share the story at this moment because the right to make such decisions as a family, free of politics, you know, freedom and all that, the stuff that uh, Republicans say they love, has never been more at stake because Republicans. Interestingly enough, he's alarmed by the threat that Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, poses to women's reproductive rights. The very conservative nominee once signed her name, onto a newspaper ad calling Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 decision that legalized abortion, barbaric. If Republicans successfully confirm her to fill Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat, she could reverse legal abortion in America or significantly curtail it. It's important for folks who are willing to tell these stories to tell them, especially now, Peters says. The new Supreme Court nominee could make a decision that will have major ramifications for reproductive health for women for decades to come. This is a pivotal moment for reproductive freedom. And, you know, of course, we'll add it's a pivotal moment for a lot of American freedoms. But this is the one that comes most immediately to mind. I can understand that. Uh, but a lot of good writing these days in just how many things essentially that you've taken for granted as American freedoms, really, for a long time, that would be in danger with uh, a, a 6-3 majority, including someone as conservative as Barrett on the court. But you've probably guessed as much. So it's also a pivotal moment for his campaign, the piece points out, with so much at stake for Peters in a purple state that narrowly broke for Trump in 2016, 
It is remarkably bold of him to go public with his own abortion story less than a month before the election. <clears throat> Three members of the House, the House, have gone public about having had abortions. California Representatives Barbara Lee and Jackie Spear, and Representative Pramila Jayapal of Washington, but no sitting senators. Peter's chance on the issue couldn't uh, stance on the issue couldn't be more different from that of his Republican challenger, John James, who supports overturning Roe and has referred to abortion as genocide. James openly opposes abortion in nearly all circumstances, including cases of rape and incest, and won't say whether he supports allowing the procedure to save the life of the mother. He won't say, of course, as you know, the press corps will not stand for not saying, right? They can't leave uh, uh, Joe Biden alone for being unwilling to discuss what his views of the idea of expanding the Supreme Court are prior to the election. And that's an outrageous cop-out and we'll never let him have a moment's rest. And here, John James won't say whether he supports allowing abortions to save the life of the mother, which of course means he doesn't and wouldn't allow it. And he doesn't want to say it because he knows it'll hurt him in the election. And reporters are happy to let him continue not saying it for some strange reason. National anti-abortion groups, of course, have endorsed James and poured money into his Senate campaign. But abortion rights activists hope that Peters sharing his story will help put a human face on the sensitive and historically politicized issue. And this is a great way of doing it, by the way. I, I Maybe it mentions this in the last paragraph. You know, maybe I can hold it until it, we'll see whether the writer and others uh, make the comment themselves first before I jump in with it. But abortion activists hope that his sharing story will help put a human face on the sensitive and historically politicized issue and in so doing, help them in the fight to protect Ginsburg's legacy. Senator Peters' family is an example of countless stories across our nation of the injustice and harm that occurs when we allow politicians who know nothing about our lives to make decisions about our pregnancies, said Elise Hoag, which is, I think, where I saw this story referenced on Twitter. She is, of course, president of NARAL. In Breaking the Silence, he not only gives voice to what's at stake, but he reminds us of our common humanity and quest for dignity and compassion when we fight for reproductive freedom for everybody. And a good concluding statement. Uh, and so I didn't see expressed the thought that I had, so I can do it now. I'll just say this. I'm, I, I appreciate his telling this story and... Uh, and, you know, at first blush, you might think, well, you know, what is going on here? That uh, Are we having the tragedy of medically necessary abortion mansplained to us here? And I don't think anybody really got that feeling in the way he told the story. But it's possible that, you know, in, in, a, in an issue for an issue area where we're used to hearing people say, uh, I don't really want male politicians explaining how it's going to go for women or how it should go for women when it comes to their own reproductive health and freedom. But I, I wanted to make a note here that it also can't always be the job of women elected officials and politicians to do the heavy lifting of telling the personal stories here. You know that, well, I mean, I guess by biological necessity. Wherever there's an abortion story, there's a, a, there's a man involved in it somewhere, depending on how, you know, it may vary how involved they are at the time the decision is made or whatever. But in most cases, it will have involved a male partner in all of this. And they, uh, to date, I guess, have all taken a pass on taking on that, that burden and that challenge of being the politician or elected official who comes forward and says, yeah, it's uh, an unpopular thing to, or un a difficult thing, an uncomfortable thing to talk about in public, but it's, it's medically necessary. It's necessary for preserving uh, regular American freedoms. It's uh, necessary for protecting reproductive freedom, just the right to, and, and of course, ironically, the right to privacy as well. You all shouldn't have to make these sorts of 
confessions, if you want to call them that, and of course you probably don't because you don't want to, you know, there shouldn't be any uh, association of, of guilt along with this, but it's something that people feel. And anyway, so there have been some brave elected women who've shared the stories and, you know, there were men involved in those. In those cases, they're not elected politicians, so perhaps it makes no sense for them to try and, you know, take the microphone and talk about it. But uh, you know that, uh, well, as we were saying, it's historic, I guess, the first sitting senator to share such a story, and that was largely because there weren't very many women in the Senate, and so it was incumbent upon the men who almost certainly had those stories to speak up, and they didn't do it for various reasons. And so it's interesting here that he has, and he says, yeah, okay, I have this story and this is important and I'll shoulder this burden. And I, I do wonder what kind of discussion that must have been uh, beforehand, but obviously he had the, the agreement and cooperation of his first wife in this because she commented for the story to the reporter as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, it'd be a, I, I, I'm sure very uncomfortable decision to say, let's share that story, but for the greater good. So very interesting. I don't know. I thought it might motivate some of you too to jump into the Peters race and provide some last minute cash. And if money starts flowing his way, it's a little late to put it in the field. True. But it does mean that you can take a flyer on a couple of things, borrow some money if necessary, uh, approve that last minute project on the hopes that the money to pay for it will come in uh, towards the end of the election, and uh, it sends a good sign that you will fight on every front. So, okay, just a few minutes here remain before the time at which I have agreed to give Eli a call, although I see, let's see, there's an email here. I should just catch up on these. Ah, well, for one thing, my first name is pronounced like Ellie. How about that? Like, uh, I guess, short for, uh, 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 instead of the name, well, is Eli... Normally, is that just the full name or is it short for like Eliezer or something like that? And maybe that's why it would be pronounced. Eli well, we'll let him tell us uh, in just a few minutes. I don't want to surprise him with a call that comes too early. That would be difficult. But I think that's all right. That's step one. So I guess he's listening uh, along. So <clears throat> or or just anticipating the issue coming up later on. So I uh, watch me forget it between now and now. And uh, a few minutes from now when I give him a call. Anything else that I need to sneak in here? Uh, there's plenty, of course, happening. Oh, you know what? Um, who pointed this one out to me? I think I got notice of this one from Mike Musson. Yes. Who sent us this uh, info on an Atlanta Journal-Constitution piece how did Mike put it in the comment? I think I'll find it here. Yes, uh, this article thematically follows the militarized police thread on the show. You know, we've talked about that as a topic for quite some time. And I don't know if we have time to get all the way through the article, but that's the story of our lives on this show. But let me introduce the topic and the approach that uh, the AJC folks are taking here. Uh, who's writing? Chris Joyner and Nick Oh boy, time uh, team or time theme? You tell me. Uh, Nick, give me a call. T H I E M E. Anybody know Nick and have a uh, clue about how he would pronounce that? I should never jump into these things without looking. Here's the 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 actual important part. The headline here: Police killings more likely in agencies that get military gear. Data shows, and I see what you mean about that, Mike. It's uh, very clearly a theme we've talked about that, that just being in possession of equipment like this, just as it is with individuals, the fact that they go out armed changes their behavior, uh, I think. I can't prove it, but I think it's a pretty good thesis that people just behave differently and approach confrontation differently, and in some cases I think more willingly, when they're armed. And I'm wondering whether police likewise do the same. Um, it's illustrated with a photo of the Columbus Police Department. I don't know, Columbus, Georgia, I would think, actually. But um, uh, with one of their, I guess I got one of those military, uh, is this an MRAP vehicle, the mine-resistant uh, vehicles, armored vehicles? I mean, it's completely out of place 
in a civilian police department, but they use it for their SWAT team. And you, oh, you never know when you're going to have to face down terrorists with AK-47s or bombs or what have you. Uh, the answer is usually never. But anyway, uh, the subheader here makes the point, hardware designed for war exerts subtle pressure on police culture, experts say. They sound like good experts. I like it. Americans have seen it time and time again in recent months on the nightly news. Protesters in the streets confronted by local police officers carrying assault rifles, some atop armored vehicles, looking more like soldiers than public servants. Much of that equipment has trickled down to police departments from a controversial Defense Department initiative known as the 1033 program, a 30-year-old, I didn't realize how old it was, 30-year-old federal initiative that provides a way for the military to dispose of surplus equipment by sending it to local police. The impact on policing has been huge. In Georgia alone, police departments and sheriff's offices have received more than 2,700 military rifles, night vision goggles, and laser gun sights, and literally hundreds of armored vehicles, including more than two dozen mine-resistant vehicles built to fight the war on terror abroad. To get military equipment, police departments pay only for the shipping costs. It's like a television late night TV deal. Uh, but that does not mean the program comes without other costs. A new AJC analysis of a decade of records across 651 Georgia police departments and sheriff's offices found departments that took more than $1,000 in 1033 money on average fatally shot about four times as many people as those that didn't. That's really amazing. I mean, I didn't know that it was going to be that bright a line. The newspaper's analysis used the military's database and paired it with the database of fatal police shootings from across the state, and thank God they even keep such a database, controlling for statistical variables like community income, rural urban differences, racial makeup, and violent crime rates. The results paint a troubling picture. The more equipment a department receives, the more people are shot and killed even after accounting for violent crime, race, income, drug use, and population. Only 7% of Georgia's law enforcement agencies received surplus military gear at any time over the 10 years, but those agencies accounted for 17% of the 261 people shot and killed by police. The statistical correlation doesn't prove that 1033 gear in a police department causes more fatal police shootings or that those shootings were unjustified. <clears throat> only that there's a strong relationship between the two. The analysis also doesn't suggest that every department in the 1033 program displays a strong relationship between the number of people killed and the amount of 1033 funding accepted. Wayne McElrath, senior investigative advisor for the Washington-based project on government, government oversight, said more violent confrontations with police track with a change in how police departments view their role. The cost that we are dealing with now is a highly militarized police force that is no longer looking like police, but is looking like they are patrolling a hostile foreign nation. He said, social science research suggests militarization also impacts how citizens view police, both positively and negatively, depending on who was asked. <clears throat> so very interesting thesis uh, and a long development and examination of it, something that I think we ought to return to at some time in the future. But I think, uh, let's see, at this point, oh, my word. Uh, I would say, okay, time for us to give Ellie uh, a call here. Uh, before I do, I, I have to note for the record here, <clears throat> who has sent me this one here? Uh, Precinct One on Twitter sends us uh, this Note, I, I know, uh, uh, Ellie, you'll, you'll agree that it was important that I interrupt things to note. This is the final straw. They send us this tweet from Polish Americans for Biden or Bidensky 2020 on Twitter. Spotted in Pittsburgh, photo by Justin Wirick, uh, a, a lawn sign out front in, uh, in a nice fall color scheme that says Trump hates pierogies. I had no idea that this was the case. <clears throat> I don't know that it actually is, but I'm willing to say it and let him sue us for it. 
damn it. I you know, don't even care. Trump hates pierogies. That man can't be allowed to be president. All right. Ellie indicates that he's ready when we are. Uh, I indicate that we are. And I'll give him a call. And uh, let's get started on this conversation uh, by pressing the correct buttons. Uh, please. Yes. Please Skype. Do your thing. Okay. This is a lot more buttons than I recall ever having to push for anybody else, but it's a special occasion. All right, and I believe hey. we are connected. Hey, Ellie, how are you? Good, how are you? Okay, I'm okay, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little <laughs> disturbed by finding out that Trump hates pierogies. Uh, but I, but, <laughs> I had know. not seen that news this uh, morning. That's no, well, uh, too much news. Yes, well, you know, it's a, it's like a, a never-ending fire hose of, of bad <laughs> news about the guy, and, and this, uh, I agree with uh, Precinct 1 here, so you sent us the thing that this is the final straw. So now we yeah. know we actually have to act. <laughs> and right. uh, so I, that, that's about as good a transition to this subject as any, I guess. Yeah. Um, we need, of course, uh, no extra preparation in this audience for us to understand the, the topic at hand here. You are currently working with the Fix Our Senate campaign. Um, which is a uh, well, you can tell us about give us the background of, of who came together to put this uh, in motion. But it reminds me, well, I think for obvious reasons, for uh, of the of a similar campaign <clears throat> that uh, finally did lead to some reform of the filibuster in the Senate prior to, well, I guess when it finally happened, 2013, but a, a few years prior to that, a similar coalition, I think, put together under a similar name. Um, is this a continuation of their work purposefully or just simply taking up the same sort of mantle? Tell us about the background of your your group. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's great to be here. Uh, I know I've been reading your coverage of filibuster reform, I think, since 2010. So I feel like I've uh, been a while. I yeah. Have a, yeah, yeah, I feel like I have a good sense of uh, how you've been thinking about this. And it's, it's certainly informed my thinking and it's been great coverage over the years. So great, the Fix Our Senate campaign uh, is a coalition of progressive organizations that have come together to uh, fight to fix the broken Senate. Uh, we started about seven months ago with a with a, an aggressive focus on Mitch McConnell and really driving the case for how McConnell broke the Senate, what he's done to broke the Senate, the ways that he's created this gridlock and obstruction and, and why that's something that needs to end. And as the election has come a little closer and there seems to be growing odds, although nothing should be taken for granted, there seems to be growing odds that Democrats could be swept into power and that Mitch McConnell could be relegated to the minority and that or maybe tossed out altogether. But his my, his yeah, uh, party can be relegated to the minority. And we are a coalition that is now advocating for the kind of rules reforms in the Senate that would make sure that if the voters choose Democratic people, Democratic elected officials and a Democratic agenda, that that agenda can then actually be implemented and that the filibuster can no longer be used by McConnell as a partisan weapon of obstruction that he can use to veto the will of the majority. And so we are a coalition. Uh, many of the same folks who were involved in the previous efforts, as you noted, um, Common Cause, Public Citizen, Communications Workers of America, uh, Working Families Party, Progressive Change Campaign Committee. Um, and we've yeah, partnered okay. with many others, including Daily Coast. Uh, Sunrise Movement, Indivisible, wow. Move On, um, Center for Popular Democracy. So this very much builds on the work that has been done over the years. Um, one of our top, one of our close advisors is Larry Cohen, the former president of the CWA, who is yeah. very involved in the Fix the Senate Now coalition that you mentioned. Uh, this absolutely builds on the work that's been done over the years by Senator Merkley and others um, to try and help advocate from the outside for what he's pushing for on the inside with Senator Warren and others. Um, so this is the the next step in those efforts that have made great progress already, uh, and there's there's still clearly more to be done. Well, yeah, there's lots still left on the table, of course, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, the original uh, push for filibuster reform back, and I guess uh, starting in 2009, uh, right after mm -hmm. the election of uh, of Barack Obama and of course uh, we're all anticipating at that point work on the Affordable Care Act although I don't know if we had the name just yet at that point but it was obvious <clears throat> that that 
piece of legislation among many others that were democratic priorities couldn't uh, uh, rely reliably be passed without either uh, uh, gaining a larger majority in the Senate or some sort of filibuster reform or some other procedural trick. And we've eventually learned uh, what what those procedural tricks were that could be used to pass it. But I think everybody remembers the complications that relying on, for instance, on budget reconciliation caused. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that right. uh, it was never well suited for the job and we had to go through all sorts of uh, convoluted uh, changes to the policies, the underlying the whole thing, just to make it fit in in reconciliation, and then of course, uh, the the next focus of the problem became uh, judges and other mm-hmm. executive appointments. Uh, the takeaway, of course, as we all remember, is that uh, what ended up happening was the elimination of filibuster for executive appointments and lower court judges, but they, for whatever reason, decided to preserve. Uh, the filibuster for the time being on on Supreme Court nominations. And then, of course, uh, that didn't work out very well. (laughs) And uh, although, uh, as it turns out, uh, since control of the Senate changed hands, uh, it wasn't the filibuster standing in the way of Merrick Garland's uh, nomination, but just the, the regular Republican Senate majority. But, yeah, a lot of people got the sense that the work was unfinished after the first round, but uh, it was uh, it was quite a long haul just to get the Senate to the place where they came to understand that this was something that they could even do. That's right. That's right. It was it was a, it was a it took a very long time for a few things. First, to help members of the Senate who have many of whom have been there for a while, who have seen the institution work in a very different way than it began to work where there was much more crossover in parties and there were truly some liberal Republicans and truly some very conservative Democrats, and they were able to forge bipartisan coalitions in much different ways than we see today. So the members took a while to to see that the Senate was changing. And also, as you know well, and as you've covered over the years, it was a stretch to help members understand and to really push the idea that rules change was possible with a simple majority. There was a long time that people were very committed to the idea that you needed two thirds of the Senate to change the rules. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't until uh, really 2011, then 2012, 2013, when it became clear that you can change the rules with a simple majority by by um, you know, raising by, by overruling the chair and having a simple up or down vote. And then now we've seen over the years that 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 is now locked in. We've seen both parties do it. It is now clear to all that that's something that could happen. And then of course it's become even clearer that. It needs to happen. I think you mentioned Merrick Garland. Members saw that a Senate, a Supreme Court seat was stolen in, in a completely unprecedented way. All norms were violated. Then McConnell set this McConnell rule that he claimed that he would, that there, there is this concept that presidents in their final year of their term should not be confirming Supreme Court justices. Fast forward to today, we saw, of course, he violated that norm yeah. in between in 20, as soon as Trump was came into office, despite all of his protests at what Reid did in 2013, McConnell turned around and changed the Senate rules himself in order to get Gorsuch and Kavanaugh confirmed. So I think what we've seen more and more, even since 2013, and what what more importantly senators are seeing, including some of these moderates and and institutionalists who have been reluctant to make additional reforms, especially to the legislative filibuster, they have now seen that the Senate has changed radically, that McConnell has broken the Senate, that he has turned the filibuster, if it ever was a tool that could force compromise and consensus. And I know, you know many of us don't think it was, but many yeah, of the senators do. If it ever thought. was that, it is no longer that. And it is no longer that tool. In fact, I mean, Senator Merkley says this all the time, if the filibuster is something that is supposed to promote bipartisanship and compromise, the filibuster has been used more than ever. Why haven't we seen this explosion of bipartisanship? So yeah. that's that's clearly <laughs> clearly a ridiculous <laughs> argument. And the, and again, more and more senators are seeing that. Yeah. Well, uh, it's about time to, and I, I don't see quite how you could miss it. Uh, we are <laughs> scheduled to take our <clears throat> our brief two minute break at this point. Uh, so we'll be back in just a bit. But, uh, yeah, when we come back, you can tell us a little bit more about, uh, one, the organizing that's going on. I understand 
You also, you have a, a background in working in the Senate yourself, so people yep. should understand that as well. We'll talk a bit, a bit more about that. Uh, when the, we'll see how the second segment goes. I think the Barrett hearings have taken Joan away from us, unfortunately, but we'll be back in two minutes to continue. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the KGRO in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that KGRO in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday, but our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents? One thin dime? We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netflix Radio. Nice music, building some tension for our second segment here with Ellie. Uh, by the way, I got the pronunciation of your first name. Is, do you, do you, uh, how do you handle the U and are you Zupnik or Zup- yeah, that's right. Zupnik. Okay. And you right. got the pronunciation of the first name perfectly. Yes, it's something that uh, most people don't yeah. get right on the first try. Well, I got a hint. So <laughs> yeah. that's, that was helpful. Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I always like the pronunciation, especially of names. It's a thing with me. I like to be able to get it right if we can. So I appreciate knowing. Um, but we were on our way out uh, from the first segment. We were kind of talking about what it took to get the Senate the member, the actual members of the Senate to come around to understanding not only the need for filibuster reform, and I think they, a lot of them kind of came to that conclusion on their own eventually, but, but many were re- resistant, uh, mm-hmm. but much more resistance to the idea of changing the rules by simple majority. You have a background working in the Senate, that's right? Uh, that's right. Okay. Uh, and you... Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? I don't know how sure. much time you spent there and with who, but sure. So I was uh, I worked in the Senate for ten years. I got there in two thousand nine. Uh, I worked the entire time for Senator Patty Murray, who oh, I'm sure okay. you yeah. and your audience know her, is the third ranking Democrat. She is a senior member. She's uh, mm-hmm. chair uh, right now, ranking member of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Was former chair of the Budget Committee. Uh, so I worked from her all the way from two thousand nine through two thousand nineteen. I left mm-hmm. around midway through nineteen. Okay. So that's uh, certainly plenty of time, in it, but all spent in the uh, well in the transitional era of, of of implementing the filibuster changes in 2013. But having arrived in 2009, you would have been there for the start of the outside portion of the campaign for for filibuster reform. And uh, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm kind of curious: Did you arrive at the job in 2009 was was filibuster reform on the radar for you personally was that something that was happening as a subject in murray's office you know it really wasn't a big topic of conversation we i came into the senate right as obama was swept in i worked on the obama campaign in 2008 Ah, came to move to washington dc afterwards to be a part of his projects to you know really change the way government worked and get things done after Mm -hmm. the bush years you know which many of us who who came of age during that time were disheartened and dispirited by what we saw and really excited by what obama promised to do and campaigned on and and i i was proud to be a part of a very small part very junior part of his uh, 2008 Mm -hmm. campaign so then i came to dc as a junior staffer junior press staffer for senator patty murray and you know i immediately saw that things were broken. I mean, you and you uh, and folks who remember 2009, it was the it was we were just in we were in the heat in the heart of the economic crisis, just maybe mm-hmm. coming back, starting to come around after the election of President Obama. He was trying to pass his his stimulus packages. He was trying to move uh, move other parts of that, his economic agenda to get things back on track. And one moment that stuck that really stuck out and, and really influenced me was 
he tried to pass an extension of unemployment insurance that was filibustered by Republicans for a month. Yes, right. I, I believe it was Senator Rand Paul. And it was a, a month when there was just there was uncertainty about when this would happen, when workers were didn't know if they were going to be able to continue getting their paychecks past 99 weeks. At that point, it was extended because of the dire straits the economy was in filibuster for a month and then passed 98 to zero that yeah. it was the filibuster sure. was just used as something that was there to slow down and obstruct president obama's agenda i saw and we all saw uh, that the republicans promised they swore up and down that they really wanted to work with president obama on health care reform we saw senator grassley yes, senator right. enzi and even senator mcconnell day in and day out saying imploring democrats please work with us don't do this in a partisan way we want to get this done. We're willing to compromise months and months and months of task force meetings and hearings. And in the end, it was you know at least clear to me that they never had any intention of actually working with Democrats, that this was Mitch McConnell stringing Democrats along, knowing what he knows so well that when, when one party controls all of government, the White House, the Senate, and the House, Voters are going to blame that party for dysfunction and gridlock. They're not going to blame the party in the minority in the Senate, even if it is the Senate mm. minority that is holding things up. So we that, I think, to me, was when it really became clear that this was a concerted, intentional strategy by McConnell to take the wind out of the sails of the president, to create as much gridlock and dysfunction as he could, to push any kind of big legislative agenda, big ticket items closer to the midterms when it would be harder and we saw it bear out. It, it worked for him. He, they took back the House in 2010. They were able to really put a throw some cold water on President Obama's agenda, to put it mildly. And then, yes. as you know, we saw later, once they took back the Senate, then they were able to stop him from actually even staffing his government and confirming judges, which was his right. And that's when we had to we took the first steps on filibuster reform. So to answer your question, this was not something high on my agenda. It was something that became it became clear and clear that work was needed uh it is something that you know i i like many others for a long time for you know the first few years didn't really think too hard about why it was needed kind of just assumed that the filibuster was was always there and was something that mm, should yeah. be there and was a part of the senate but of course that that is wrong and that's something that became clear to me and many others yeah well it was certainly something we we found uh, was a major obstacle in in our own organizing and discussion with uh, senators and and staff. Um, yeah, you know, and stood to reason we understood why why that was the case. But yeah, that was the the big challenge uh, to get them to realize in some cases that it was going to be necessary, and in others that this was a real thing and a real procedure that had actually happened before. <clears throat> right, it was one of right. The big, the big they, stumbling uh, blocks. Many senators they truly believe that this is a core part of the institution and it, it's always been there it's part of the just this mystique of what they see as this institution of the senate and that as you note that that's that's just not right it's been changed many times over the years it was never used as a de facto 60 vote supermajority requirement until very recently it was rarely used at all except of course with its tragic mm -hmm. use deplorable use to stop civil rights reform and to civil rights bills and to maintain white supremacy. And then it, it, it became relatively recently, you know, started up in 2000 a little bit, but really not until Mitch McConnell took over. Uh, we, we, Mitch McConnell really used it as a tool of obstruction against President Obama. Did it become something that is just now it is understood that unless you get 60 votes in the Senate, you can't move a bill. And that that is like, that, that is not the way it yeah. was supposed to be. It's not the way it can work, and it, it's not the way it should be. It was really a remarkable uh, bit of, uh, I don't know what we call it, almost it like social engineering that, uh, that worked That's this right. way, that for a long time, both before and after the original, well, not even, it wasn't the original filibuster reform campaign. That that happened, uh, you know, even earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I placed that probably in the 50s, as it <laughs> turns out. But uh, it, during this uh, period of the, in, following Obama's election, um, there was, uh, that it really made it into consciousness that uh, even, well, I'm not even sure how we would put it, but, but, but certainly the repetition of the phrase, 
everybody knows it takes mm-hmm. 60 votes to do anything <laughs> in the Senate. And that was, I mean, Chuck Schumer said that before he was uh, a Democratic leader. He was still assistant uh, leader at that point. Harry Reid was uh, still atop the uh, Democratic caucus. But that was something that people would say offhand. Everybody knows. That's just, a, you, you learn this in civics. It was practically <laughs> schoolhouse rock. It takes 60 votes to get anything done in the Senate. And that was a very recent phenomenon. Uh, That's right. And Chuck Schumer had been, certainly he was in the House during the period in which that was just never the case. But uh, I don't know. People just uh, sort of accepted that. And it became clear early on, not only for the Affordable Care Act, but for everything else that anybody hoped to accomplish in the Senate. And that was one of the organizing principles of this first campaign was it doesn't matter what your issue is. We very frequently divide ourselves, at least nominally, and silo ourselves on, on the progressive side of the spectrum, the liberal side of the spectrum, uh, with our own top issues. And sometimes that makes for, you know, a competitive uh, situation. People say, well, I, I, you know, I think the environment needs to be issue number one, and we can't do it. What's the point of doing anything? It was a very valid argument. What's the point of taking care of any of these problems if the planet dies? That, that's true. Yeah. Good point. Uh, well, what's the point of taking care of this if we don't have, you know, civil rights? What's the point of this if we don't do something about, you know, uh, health care access or torture, for that matter, was on the table at the time. Um, and uh, it, the point of this was to say it all it, they're all gigantic problems, all of which are untouchable until there is a situation resolved in the Senate where one senator or a concerted effort of a party can block whatever it is you wanted to do, no matter what the election results were, unless you win 60 plus seats and hold every one of them, which is not a situation we see very much anymore. Uh, you, you None of this could get done, at least not in any effective form, without giving away major concessions that would knock holes in any policy you might choose to put forward. And we're very much in the same spot today. We didn't solve that problem, but we did solve the problem of how to approach it, which is where this new campaign, I guess, comes in. You mentioned all the various strategic partners in this, and it's it's pretty clear. Uh, And and it's interesting, too, to see the sort of new generation of of policy and advocacy groups joining in, both uh, the uh, Sunrise Movement, which uh, wasn't uh, didn't exist at the time in the 2010 mm-hmm. time period, I don't think. Uh, but if right. it exists in different form now and a very much more empowered movement uh, and uh, indivisible as well, as you point out. And um, Well, the Trump era has done a lot to galvanize, I'm sure, uh, That's that, right. that effort and, and uh, finding common threads and synergy between groups. So I'm glad that this... The, that that band has been brought back together. <laughs> yeah, that that is absolutely a core part of our theory on this. Is that this is not something that this, this is not an issue in and of itself. Nobody, ordinary people going about their day to day lives, should not care about a Senate procedure in and of itself. But they should care about the climate crisis. They should care about jobs in the economy. They should care about their access to health care and the cost of prescription drugs and immigration reform and gun safety, gun violence civil rights, of course, racial justice. These are issues that people should and do care about. And what we are trying to help people understand is that every single one of those issues is progress on any of them is completely blocked unless we find a way to take this this weapon out of Mitch McConnell's hands next, or out of Republicans' hands next, uh, should Biden win. And that it is not, that these are issues that are, that people expect progress on. They will potentially have just voted swept Democrats into power to clean up the messes that Trump is making to make progress on these issues, and none of which are possible unless we eliminate the filibuster as this partisan tool. So that's why, as you noted, we have the Brady campaign in our coalition because they know their top priorities are background checks and other common sense gun safety legislation, uh, assault weapons ban. Not, that's certainly not possible if the NRA gets to keep their people together and the special interests that Mitch McConnell listens to get to keep their people together and use the filibuster to block progress. Same on any kind of health care reform you want, whether it's, you know, whether it's the, the most expansive versions of Medicare for all 
or the the next clear next steps like like adding a public option no matter what you want none of it is possible unless we get rid of the filibuster and to be clear getting rid of the filibuster isn't a magic trick that lets you pass anything you want you know this it's it's uh it sure. it but it's it's not something you know mitch mcconnell will claim that you hear him out there saying that if, if democrats get rid of the filibuster they'll be able to pass their socialist wish list and and all of that that's not true. The reality is you get the filibuster, getting rid of the filibuster and fixing the Senate is the key that unlocks the door, that gets you in the door, that unlocks any possibility of progress. You still have to fight for things. You still have to work hard. There's still some battles ahead of us. And it's not going to, it's not the end of the story, but it at least gives you a chance. And right now we have a Senate that just, the door is slammed to anyone who wants progress, to anyone who wants to change. And that's going to be a massive problem if we come out of this crisis, we come out of the crisis of the Trump presidency, we are in the middle of a COVID pandemic and an economic crisis that has resulted from President Trump's mismanagement of it. And people are expecting change. They're expecting results. They will have just hopefully just swept a new party into power. And it, it, is, it is growing more and more inconceivable to many, not just on the left, but across the board, that the idea that Democrats would do nothing, would let Mitch McConnell stop everything, would give, would have to ask his permission after voters just put them into power. That is growing more and more inconceivable, which is what makes me hopeful. And it, it's been exciting to see so many of these different groups. You mentioned Sunrise. We have these incredible kids, young people, youth. Uh, I, I've been, I'm betraying some of my, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm no longer a youth. Whippersnappers, sadly, but, you might say. <laughs> Yeah, we have incredible young people going across the country who are getting involved in the first time because they care about their future, because they care about what is happening to the climate, what is happening to the, to the planet. And they are, they are working hard to make change on November 3rd. And we and others and, and, and many people are, are making sure everyone understands that this doesn't stop on November 3rd, that this needs to, the fight needs to continue to make sure that the Senate is fixed, so that we can actually pass these things. And then, of course, Everyone needs to keep advocating on the issues they care about to make sure that we can, once that key is unlocked, once the door is unlocked in the Senate and McConnell is relegated to his proper role in the minority, then we can actually move to start getting things done and delivering results for people. Yeah, well, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult uh, to get everybody that we need engaged, engaged in this election and then tell them afterward uh, we won with your help and we can now know. Uh, we cannot do any of the things that That's we said right. we were going to do. And, you know, uh, I've been wa in watching the Sunrise Movement and uh, affiliated uh, elected leaders doing their best to get used to the way things are, whatever that might mean, in Washington. Um, it, it's been frustrating, I'm sure, for them, but frustrating for others as well in, in, in watching them uh, grow frustrated at, their inability to influence the agenda. And of course, one, you don't want that to, to happen and to persist for too long, or they begin dropping out or turning their attention elsewhere, which is, would be a huge mistake here. But uh, it's increasingly impossible to explain to them that, well, that's just not the way things work, because of course they ask why or why not, and the answer <laughs> is, I'm not, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> it just kind of right. always was. and. You know, that's never going to be a satisfactory answer. Uh, so it will have to have a, a better one to start with. Um, but yeah, th this uh, also I was interested in your the, the threat from McConnell saying, you know, without the filibuster, there's no way to prevent the, the crazy socialist agenda from being implemented. But that obviously won't resonate with anybody, you know, in, in our audience. We're not going to buy into McConnell's uh, uh, argument. And but. It is an interesting thing to know. I mean, if, if it was the case that using the numbers of the Senate, because it's a nice round number of 100, if 59 percent of the country or the Senate was that close to going socialist. <laughs> but, you know, the, thank God one guy, you know, got to stand up and put a stop to it. Uh, that wouldn't make any sense to a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people who fear socialism for whatever reason. Uh, I guess would stick to their guns, but if 59% of the country were so interested that we wanted to sweep that into power, uh, how would you explain to people that no, nah, you know, almost 60, almost 60% of the country wants this or any other 
It doesn't have to be a crazy socialist agenda, whatever that is. Anything, something that 80% of the country wants, background checks for gun yeah. purchases, cannot have it because one guy says no, makes no sense to anybody. You know, long story, long standing story and a long standing problem. Um, so I guess we don't need to convince anybody at this point of its necessity. But um, one of the other issues, I guess, uh, I was thinking back of the other, the earlier campaign. Uh, how much time we had to spend convincing senators and staffers that this was a, a thing that could happen, even though we said, you know, I can show you, uh, here's the congressional record of the day it was last done. And That's right. 1975 or so. And uh, I'm, it comes to mind because Joe Biden who was then, uh, had previously been in the Senate, was now newly installed as vice president. Very because he had spent so long in the Senate, very resistant to the idea of filibuster reform. And despite the fact that we were able to point out not directly to him because he wasn't talking to us because he wasn't in the Senate anymore, but other allies of his in the Senate, uh, Joe Biden voted for this procedure in 1975. He was here. He wasn't, yeah. the, and he wasn't the only one. But uh, in 1975, it made sense for him, and he joined in the effort to reduce. The filibuster or the the cloture th threshold from sixty seven to sixty, that thing which we all know, you know, everybody knows it only takes sixty <laughs> votes. Uh, in nineteen seventy four, it took sixty seven votes. Except it never did take that, because nobody would do anything as ridiculous as block overwhelmingly popular legislation from the minority. Unless it was, That's of course, right. you know, civil rights. Yeah, that certainly was the anomaly there. But uh, so I, I wonder now also, I guess we are going to face a slightly different subject, but something that also may that, that is becoming increasingly popular that can't happen probably without elimination of the legislative filibuster uh, court expansion uh, now on everybody's mind as we watch the Amy Coney Barrett hearings and reflect on. How many seats have been stolen on the Supreme Court? Uh, a similar issue uh, in that it's, you know, a momentous change and departure from where we've been for many years. The possibility of D.C. or Puerto Rican statehood, uh, both of which would re require uh, overcoming certainly filibusters. But the, the court expansion a little bit easier to contemplate in that context. But uh, again, here we have Joe Biden in, in the middle of things as the Democratic nominee for president. He's, I guess, understandably reluctant to comment on something that's essentially going to come down to Senate procedure, even though he spent the vast majority of his career there. So he's having difficulty uh, signing on with the prospect, for instance, of expanding the, the courts. Uh, but I, I note that last time around, he and others were very resistant to filibuster reform, and the fact that he might exhibit some resistance now uh, just says, I, I believe we've been there before and applied the pressure in the right way, and they're, as we said, getting the band back together could make this very possible after the election, and even without that sort of pressure, opinions may change vastly after an election is secured, but this too will be on, on your plate. You have to do this. This is your job. <laughs> well, this is it's, there's a it's whole lot of you. partners. This is something that yes. that has, as I mentioned before, this is a broad coalition of people who are building on work that's been done over years and years and years. Um, but I do I do want to pick up on one point you made about McConnell because I think it's such an important Please. one. It's so core to how to to why this is so important. It's not just the fight about not just the filibuster fight, but so many of these democracy reforms and just general structural reforms that people are thinking about is that. Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party right now rely on they, – they do not have a majority of support. Their policies don't. They personally don't. We saw the president lost the popular vote. The Senate, even though they have a majority, they got fewer votes. They are able to put member people on the Supreme Court with those fewer votes who are, are going to determine laws and, and – uh, what 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 things what policies look like for generations? So they are very much a minority government that is ruling from that is ruling as a majority and that wants to continue their obstruction even from a minority. And that that is what the filibuster truly does. It turbocharges. It takes an institution that has is already 
biased or slanted True. toward yes. the minority, small states, conservative states, conservatives generally, and it turbocharges that. It gives it a tiny, tiny minority. I mean, you uh, th there are different ways that people run the math, but but one one formula I saw had it that 11 percent of the country represented by 41 senators can block the will of mm. the 89 percent supported by 59. And that is it's not democratic in any sense of the word. I mean, we see they have senators like Mike Lee out there saying that they don't really <laughs> care about democracy right. so that they are showing their cards. They are telling it uh, they are being somewhat honest about what they see is that they believe that their minority should rule. And that, that is what this fight over the filibuster is about, that if voters sweep Democrats into office on an agenda that is clear, I mean, they, they, there's a clear agenda about you know, raising the minimum wage, expanding access to health care, tackling the climate crisis in a, in a bold, meaningful way. These are things that will be on the ballot that if Democrats win, they will have a, an expectation and a mandate to implement. And it should not be the case that a small number of senators representing a minority of people and led by Mitch McConnell, who is controlled by special interest groups and his donors, it should not be the case that they can block this. So I, I think that is such an important point and it's something that's driving more and more people to, to get involved. And like all of those issues you mentioned, they, it, none of them are possible unless the filibuster is reformed. And I'm hopeful when I hear, I mean, you, you mentioned um, Vice President Biden a couple of times. I'm hopeful by what he, what we've heard him say. I mean, he is someone who clearly, I mean, this is no surprise to anyone. He clearly wants to work in a bipartisan way. He, that is his, he would like to have a Republican party that works with him, that compromises, that is willing to get things done. But it has become very clear, and I think based on his public comments, even to him, that that is just not the Republican Party right now. I mean, he he mentioned that he would he wants to see if they're obstreperous, which is, I think, a, a word that entered a lot of our vocabularies after he said it. Uh, I know mine anyway. Uh, so that that I think is a, a clear sign that he is looking carefully to see, are they going to actually be a partner or are they just going to be obstreperous, obstructionist and block everything and he made it clear, and uh, and others in the Senate who have been reluctant beforehand, like Senator Coons, like Senator Tester, um, and, and Senator Schumer, of course, has made pretty uh, great comments, um, mm. highlighting that he he is he wants to be a majority leader that gets things done, and he has said anything's on the table, uh, which I think is a very clear sign that Republicans um, you know, that, that they have a good sense of who McConnell is, how they're going to obstruct, and that that's just simply not going to be acceptable right now. Yeah, well, I'm hopeful that that's the case. And it is a little bit of a different situation if we were installing Joe Biden as president that, with his long experience in the Senate than was the case in installing Barack Obama with a relatively short experience in the Senate. And he may have felt, I don't wonder whether Obama at any point felt constrained for many reasons uh, in uh, seeming like he was running roughshod somehow over the Senate, although eventually it got to the case where it's simply, I'm endorsing the change you want to see made. And, and that was a, a more comfortable position for him where Biden might feel a little bit uh, more at ease in discussing this out front. Uh, well, I guess we will we'll see. And uh, if you're willing at some point in the future, the, there's a lot more discussion I'd love to have <laughs> about this stuff with you. And maybe at some point in the future, it might not be nailed down yet to talk about what form you see the uh, changes taking and whether uh, it would be of interest to have some sort of uh, incremental type reform or the imposition of a talking filibuster. We can explain what that might be about at some point in the future uh, or, or whether the, the goal is singular and about elimination entirely outright and right from the beginning. But uh, we are we're out of time for today's discussion, which is amazing because we gave it 45 minutes. But thank you for giving us so much time on it and explaining the background for it. And uh, any any time you might find a chance to join us again, let us know and we'll arrange it. This has been great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And anyone can go to fixoursenate.org if they want more information. Okay, very simple. Fixoursenate.org. Uh, similar to the name of, you might remember Fix the Senate. This is FixOurSenate.org. And uh, yeah, and you can follow uh, Elliot on Twitter as well as the Fix Our Senate 
Youth.org organization, both on there and both have a presence. Uh, again, thanks, thanks for approaching us about it and making the suggestion. It's a good, good sign for your uh, lobbying abilities. <laughs> you made this work. <laughs> it's great, great to be on, and happy to come on anytime. Terrific. Thanks very much, Ellie. Take care. We'll talk to you again soon. I hope. And uh, all right, we'll wind things up then for the day here on the Kegro in the Morning Show and get you ready for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy coming up next with Justice Putnam. we get our music back up. And I press all the right buttons for me to try and scramble through the summary he's got for today's show and decide what's the most important thing to try to squeeze in right after this familiar message. From NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to Kegro in the Morning with David Waldman. Hmm, how about this? Right up at the top of the show, a second late-stage COVID-19 vaccine trial is paused again over a participant's unexplained illness. There's a lot of unexplained illness circulating around this. And international news at the bottom half of the show where Mexico charged the United States with performing surgery on Mexican migrant women against their will.